start the recording. All right, we are live. Uh, hopefully audio and video is still working and you should see the slides. So it's Monday, welcome to Structural Analysis. Uh, just a couple quick uh, housekeeping items. Uh, you know, same pattern as we've been doing. Uh, the last time work was graded. I have here that the solutions posted, but I might have forgotten to turn that on. But I'll turn that on after class if I haven't uh, if I haven't updated that. Uh, homework 3.2 was due today, but I guess for a, a little bit of time last night there was an outage on Blackboard. So I said I'm just going to go ahead and extend that deadline until 5 p.m. today for the homework that's due today, uh, and then we'll get that graded tomorrow. And then I'm going to assign homework 3.3 uh, today, uh, and with that we'll just uh, keep on trucking. Um, what I want to do today is I want to um, I want to look at two things that uh, we have yet to discuss with joints, uh, and one of them is looking at a, a method of joints analysis that involves two diagonals, um, because we have yet to solve that. I mean, you have the the tools and abilities to to handle that on your own, but I figure let's go ahead and go through that a bit formally, and we'll have an example to that effect. And then if I've got a little bit of time at the end, I have a discussion on zero force members, um, and I want to show you that. So I've got some stuff here on the board to hopefully make that a little more straightforward. <clears throat> so again, you know, let, you know, we've been talking about trusses for the last couple of lectures. Uh, you know, just, you know, keep in mind that, you know, all the members are connected by frictionless joints. You know, all the loads and reactions are applied only at the joints. At each joint, you know, the, we, we ensure that the centroids all meet. And so what that means is that each of your uh, 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 members are either experiencing tension or compression. They're only experiencing axial loads. And in order to determine all of the forces inside a truss, we have either the method of joints or the method of sections. And so Wednesday, we'll, we'll discuss the method of sections. We're only going to have one day on that because uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty short and sweet uh, topic. But method of joints, there's a lot to discuss because a lot of what we do in here, we end up solving the entire truss um, for a number of reasons, either for deflections or when we do influence lines and whatnot. Uh, and so it's kind of, um, you know, you kind of need to know it all. So that's why the method of joints, at least in my opinion, is, is, uh, is much more important. Um, now, what I want to do today is I want to discuss how to solve a joint with two diagonals. Um, and so when you when that happens, when you have a joint that has two uh, diagonals that are unknowns, um, you end up having a problem that looks like this. And so it's probably been a while since you've done this here. I'm actually going to stop the share for a second because I want to pull this up. So, uh, you know, look here on the board and you can see all right, here on this upper portion. Let's look at, at you know, this set of it's probably been a while since you've done this. It might have been uh, high school algebra. It might have been. Uh, when you took Engineering 111, um, and uh, I, I know that you know, I'm teaching statics, and, and we started doing you know a couple of these types of problems in statics, uh, but it's definitely not something that you do all the time. Okay, um, the goal is I've got these two equations, uh, x plus 2y equals 3. This is just an example. x plus 2y equals 3, and 2x plus 3y equals 4. And the idea is to find those magic numbers, those magic values of x and y that satisfy both equations. And so I'll go ahead and tell you that the answer to that is right here, x equals minus 1 and y equals 2. And if you don't believe me, just plug and chug. Well, take the first equation. I have negative 1 plus 2 times 2 is 4. Negative 1 plus 4 is 3. Okay, what about the next one? 2x plus 3y. So that's negative 2 plus 6 is 4. Okay, and those are the only two values, the only value of x and the only value of y that satisfy both equations. I and mean, the idea is that each of these equations are a line, and then when you plot those lines, that's the coordinates of the point where they where they meet. Okay. Now, why is that relevant here? Well, it's relevant because when you solve a, a, a joint, well, really any joint, you have two equations and two unknowns. And when you have diagonals, uh, the, the issue when you have diagonals is it's not like before where, you know, you can sum forces in the x direction and just get that one member, and then sum forces in the y direction and get the other. You end up having both unknowns marred up in both equations, and so you kind of have to take a little bit more of a general approach. Um, there's a couple of ways you can go about it. You can use substitution, you can use elimination, but really what I found is the easiest is to just straight up use your Casio, just use matrix algebra. Uh, really any scientific calculator or graphing calculator will do this. I'll review how to do this for the Casio, um, but you all, if you have a different calculator, I would just uh, suggest that you get it, you know you break out your user's manual your user's manual 
uh, maybe you gotta uh, you know go to YouTube or something to to find a tutorial on that. Usually it's pretty simple, but it's something you might not do quite regularly. Um, just to go back to algebra land, so this is sort of how you would do it by hand. Uh, substitution. So substitution involves taking one of the equations and isolating one of the variables. So for instance, on the first equation, I could isolate x. So I have x equals a pile of junk, so x equals 3 minus 2y, and then take that expression for x and plug it in here. So instead of x, I use the 3 minus 2y, plug and chug, and then I have a little bit of uh, a hot mess of algebra, but I just take that and I, I you know, wind it down and, and solve until I get y equals 2, and then take that and sub it into the, uh, one of the other equations to get uh, x equals minus 1. That's one method. Uh, another method is to take one of these equations and multiply it by what I call a, a, a magic constant, a magic scalar. So for instance, if I take this first equation and I multiply everything in the first equation by minus 2, what happens is I get a minus 2x, and I can compare that with the positive 2x uh, on the second equation, and if I add everything up, the, uh, the x's cancel, and so then I'll get y equals minus 2, and I can either repeat that process for the y's, or I can substitute uh, what have you. Those are the two ways that you probably did it by hand when you were in high school, or you did it maybe in an algebra or pre-calc class uh, here at Marshall. Um, but what I want to make sure that everybody's comfortable with is to do this using the matrix uh, uh, format. In other words, to use your, your Casio. So what we can do is we can take these expressions and we can write them in matrix form. So uh, all that means is over here on the left side, we take all of these coefficients and we turn it into a square matrix. So I've got one, two, two, and three. That's just the coefficients for each of these terms. And then I've got this column vector over here, which are just the constants over here, three and four. Now, what I mean by matrix algebra, technically what you'll be doing is you've got this expression here, you know, this square matrix times my unknowns e equals this column vector. The general solution is to take the inverse of this matrix and multiply it by that. Now, if you do that by hand, that can be a, a bit late, uh, laborious, but Fortunately, your calculator will just do this for you. Once you have it in this form, you literally just put the numbers into your calculator, press enter, and it just does it for you. How that works is, so this is how it works on your Casio. So, uh, and, and again, if you have a different calculator, you can, you know, uh, uh, figure this out. Uh, most calculators is going to be very, very similar. So what you do on the uh, Casio is, if you look on your uh, calculator, there's a mode button, M-O-D-E. Uh, when you press the mode button, what it does is it brings up this, um, let me bring up my pointer, it brings up this dialog box that you see here, uh, and so when you're just normally operating your calculator, you're operating in mode one, that's just the computations mode, so if I open the calculator and I want to do two plus three, that's mode one. Mode five is the equation solver. Uh, and what you're going to do is uh, use option one. Option one is a two by two system like we have here, you know, two equations, two unknowns. Option three would, if you, would be if you were looking at three equations, three unknowns. Uh, but for what we're doing here with joints, we really only need option one. And then what that, what that does is it brings up a, a table uh, entry that looks something like this. You should have, uh, you know, uh, this, this column, you know, matrix type uh, entry. And what you do is you just enter in you know, the six numbers that are important. And what I mean by the six numbers are important, I mean, you know, this square matrix and this column vector just smushed together uh, as one big column of data. So one, two, three, two, three, four, and you just press enter and there you go. X equals minus one and Y equals two. And it just does it for you. And so that's a pretty useful skill to understand. I would also make sure that you understand that for the FB because that's something that you could probably do on that exam. Uh, and knowing how to do that in your calculator will save you a lot of time. Okay, uh, unless there are any questions, again, I know it's probably been a while since you've done this, but um, I want to uh, uh, sort of use it and practice to make sure that, you know, all that math that you learned back in the day that actually had a use. So I, I have here a, a trust system. What we're gonna do is we're gonna compute the internal member forces meeting at joint A. Uh, of this truss, and we're going to do it using the method of joints. Now, I just picked joint A. There, there's not really any um, particular reason to start there. We could start at joint D, 
because um, remember, when we apply a method of joints process, we always start by picking a joint that has at most two unknowns. So we could not start the process with joint C or B because both of those joints have three members meeting. So we'd have to start at either joint A or joint D. But the reason I like this truss is because regardless of whether you start at joint A or joint D, you're still dealing with two unknowns, but both of those unknowns are diagonals, okay? And that creates a little bit of an added layer of complexity, okay? And so I kind of want to show you how to assess that. Uh, it's, it's pretty mechanical. It's pretty rote. It's not very difficult. Um, but once you, uh, uh, once you get through this, I think you'll find it, it, it's not so bad. All right, so I'm going to stop the share. I said I'm going to stop the share. There we go. All right, let me uh, share the screen, which, by the way, I've got my, my setup here. So I've got my chat pulled up here. So if you have any questions, just, just let me know. There we go. Okay, so let's go to here. All right, so let me take my keyboard off. All right, let me do this over here. Okay. Go to draw. Okay, so here's the problem. And like I said, I went ahead and gave you the reactions. Like I said, I'll probably do that for a while now just because, I mean, if you can do reactions, I don't need you to prove it over and over and over again during class. I mean, I hope, hope you would just uh, trust me on these values. Okay, um, first thing I want to do is I want to, before I look at this joint, I want to sort of investigate my slope ratios. I found that when you're dealing with two diagonals, it's kind of easiest to just deal with this part first. So let's let's look at member AB. Okay, so so let's take member AB. Now member A, if you look, you can see I went ahead and uh, included the slope ratio so you can see we go 30 foot over and 30 foot up so member a b is going to be a one to one slope ratio and if you have a right triangle and each of the legs are one unit long then the hypotenuse is the square root of two okay so hopefully that that's uh, pretty straightforward all right what i want to do is i want to look at each of these x and y components and i want to see if i can express them with respect to the diagonal, okay? So for instance, I propose that if I'm looking at member AB, I propose that the X component is to one as the member itself is to the square root of two. Likewise, member ABY or component ABY is to one as AB is to the square root of two. And you could do that all in one equation if you want, um, I'm just, doing it a little bit more segmented. Um, so therefore, ABX is one over the square root of two AB. Likewise, ABY is one over the square root of two AB. Now that's a little bit different than how we've been doing that. Um, when we've been doing uh, method of joints analyses up until now, because up until now, um, what we've been doing is we've been saying, okay, we have the X component, what is the Y component? Or we have the Y component, what is the X component? Instead, what I'm saying is, how do I express the X and Y component in terms of the diagonal, okay? So it's a little bit different. Uh-oh, did I go away? I'm sitting here looking at my my uh, my screen here, and I think I kind of ducked out there for a second, or maybe I didn't. I don't know. If I um, if the connection starts to have any issues, just let me know. Um, okay. All right. So now let's look at the method of joints at A. Now, here's the kicker when you're doing method of joints um, 
for two diagonals. This is always what uh, I recommend um, when you're when you're dealing with two diagonals. I recommend that you assume both members are in tension. Okay. And the reason why I do that is because depending upon your loads and depending upon the way the, the joint uh, is, is uh, oriented, um, it's not that easy sometimes to determine which member's in tension, which member's in compression, are they both in tension, are they both in compression? And so more often than not, when you're dealing with two diagonals, you're kind of making a guess anyways when you start out. And so since the math is a bit more involved, what I always say is, look, just assume that it's intention. Just, just do that right off the bat. So that if you get a negative answer, you know it's in compression. And, and so it's, it's, it's actually a little bit more of a foolproof way of ensuring that you do the problem correctly, okay? So it's something I always recommend uh, that you do. Okay, now let me see if I can, can I? Let me try this, see if I can scroll down a bit. Let me just make a little mark there so that it'll scroll. There we go. Okay, so we're gonna assume both members are in tension and what we're gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna draw this joint out. So let's put this joint down here, okay? Now let's, first off, let's draw the loads that are on the joint. So this is the reaction here, this is AY. And this is 25 kips, and then we have AX here. This is AX, and this was 40 kips. Okay, so there's my, my two uh, 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 joint loads. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw my diagonals. Now I'm gonna draw member AB going like this. Uh, remember that was at a one to one slope ratio, so maybe I'll go ahead and put that on there. That's one and that's one. Uh, and then let's go ahead and put the components. Now, again, I'm assuming tension. So we're going to assume that both arrows yank away from the joint. And so this is A, B, Y, A, B, X. Okay. And now what we'll do is we'll do the same thing for member A, C. So member A, C, it sort of went like that. Um, this is a one to two. Again, that drawing is probably a little off on the scale, but but that's okay. And then this is A C Y A C X. Okay. All right. That's probably one of the hardest parts, just right there, just getting all those forces drawn correctly and getting that in the uh, the right direction. Okay. Now. What we can do is we can go ahead and sum the forces in the x direction and sum the forces in the y direction, and let's do that separately, okay? So let's start off with the x direction. So sum of the forces in the x direction. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start listing the forces as we've, we've derived them. So let's look at our joint. Now let's see what we've got. So first off, uh, at the joint itself, we do have a force to the left, and so we have AX is 40 kips, and that's going to the left. And then what do we have going to the right? We have ABX, and we have ACX. But we went, we already derived a formula for those, so what did we get before? We got ABX was one over the square root of two AB, and we got ACX was, what did we get here? Oh, we didn't do AC. Oh, whoops, I skipped that one. Oh, I know what happened. I know what happened. I, uh, uh, my internet connected, or I had some issues with my internet connectivity, and, and I kind of skipped that one. Ah. Y'all just let me truck along, didn't didn't stop me. The question is, do I do I blame like 
actual Ben or do I blame the cartoon Ben that showed up earlier? For those of you that weren't on the call earlier, you might have missed that. All right, let's do uh, let's do AC. I blame the cartoon. They are more wackier, and you should always keep your eyes out. The tune physics are scary. Go. There we go. Uh, <laughs> let's do let's do member AC. Okay, so I, f I forgot this one. All right, let me go back here. Okay, so here's member AC. So let's let's draw this out. Okay, so here's my triangle, and this is one, and this is two. Now, Pythagorean theorem says two squared plus one squared is c squared. So c squared is five. That makes this the square root of five. So ACX is to the horizontal component is two, as AC is to the diagonal. That's the square root of five. So ACX is two over the square root of five AC, and then ACY is to one, as AC is to the square root of five. So ACY is one over the square root of five AC. There we go. Don't wanna forget that, that's kind of important. Okay, so we have the ABX is one over square root of two, and we have ACX is two over the square root of five, all right? So I'm gonna write this as two over the square root of five AC. Okay. So therefore, I have 40 kips is one over the square root of two AB plus two over the square root of five AC, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that is equation one, all right? Is everybody with me on this so far? I wanna just, just march along. I wanna make sure that, that, uh, that everybody's following me. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. I got it. Good deal. All right. So let me sum forces in the y direction. We'll do this right here. Okay. And so with the y direction, we've got everything pointing upwards. So we have AY is 25 kips. We have ABY which is, what was that? That was uh, one over the square root of two AB. We have ACY, which was one over the square root of five AC. I'd argue that if there's any one thing that's maybe difficult, it's just your bookkeeping, making sure that you use the right uh, uh, ratios with the right components and that you're getting your signs, uh, you know, your positives and negatives uh, correct. Uh, that's probably the hardest part. All right. 25 kips plus 1 over the square root of 2AB plus 1 over the square root of 5AC is 0. Because everything is on the left-hand side and there's nothing on the right-hand side of the table. So what do we do from here? Well, we need to take these two equations and we need to sort of write them in this format. So Apollo junk times AB plus Apollo junk times AC equals Apollo junk. So with equation one, that would be one over the square root of two AB plus two over the square root of five AC equals 40. And then with equation two, I need to take that 25 kips and I need to move it on to the other side of the equation. So I need to say one over the square root of two. Oh, I can do better than that. One over the, the square root of two AB plus one over the square root of five AC 
is minus 25 kips. Okay, so I need I need to make sure that the equations are written in that that system of equations format. And then what I can do is I can take these ex these expressions. Ooh, that, that's way too far on the scroll. Okay, so now what I can do is I can take these expressions and I can write them in that matrix format. So I put my my constants here. my variables here and my constants here. So this is 40, this is minus 25. And so here you go. I've got my, my equation set up to do this in my Casio. So let's say that everybody here has their Casio. And if you have a different calculator, again, you might wanna uh, either break out your user's manual or, or go onto YouTube or something like that just to make sure that you're clear on that. If you have any questions, um, you all can always contact me during my office hours and we can see like, hey, let's um, let's go through the uh, 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 calculator and make sure that we're comfortable with this. We can use this example as a basis to ensure that we're doing things correctly. So um, I'm going to you know, do this the way that you would do it on the, the Casio. So mode five, one, that'll get you into the equation solution. And so I believe it's like one, two, and then it's like A, B, and C. And so you would just enter in these six numbers, you know, one divided by the square root of two, uh, two over the square root of five, uh, 40, one over the square root of two, one over the square root of five, minus 25. And what'll happen is the Casio will spit out an X and a Y quantity for you. So I'm actually, I'm gonna rely on chat for this one or somebody with their microphone. I want somebody to do this and I'm gonna ask for a second on this one too because I wanna make sure everybody's good on this. I want you to plug these values in and tell me what do you get for X and what do you get for Y? Because this is how your calculator is going to report it. It's not going to say A, B, and A, C. It's just going to say X and Y. So I'm going to give you all a sec. Tell me what you get. Oops, spilled my coffee. Maybe I've had too much coffee this morning. Got all jittery and spilled it. All right, here we go. All right, so anybody have a value for me for X and Y? And again, if you got any questions as we go through this, let me know. Okay, I have X is negative, negative 127 point, what was that, 28, oh, and positive, what is that, 145, that is correct, and I've got a couple other people in the class saying they got the same thing, that's great, and so here's, here's what you do, all right, it's simple, so therefore, you know, the way that you entered this in, the X corresponds to, you know, this is X. This is corresponds to Y. So AB is the 127 and AC is the 145. Now, remember what we did at the very, very beginning. Remember how we said that we were going to always just blanketly assume the members are in tension? Well, we got one negative answer. So this is 127.28 kips in compression. This is 145.34 kips in tension. And it's that simple, okay? So what you can do is if you were trying to solve the entire truss, so now you have A, B, and A, C. If you've got A, B, and A, C, you can scroll up and you can say 
Well, if I've got A, B, and A, C, here's my, you know, uh, equations for the X and Y components. I can take those and get A, B, X, A, B, Y, A, C, X, A, C, Y, and then just treat the rest of the problem like a regular old method of joints analysis and go to joint B and say, well, I know this diagonal. That's member A, B, so I know the X and Y components. What's everything else? It's that simple. It's really not that difficult. Again, it, there's, a, there's a few more steps because um, you've got the, because where you've got the two diagonals, let me scroll that down a bit so everybody can write that down. So there's a few more steps because there's more diagonals, but you're still employing the same principles. You know, you're still using your slope ratios. You're still using the sum of forces in the X direction, sum of forces in the Y direction. You just ended up coming up with two equations that weren't just directly solvable. Like up until now, we would sum forces in the Y direction and there'd just be one unknown, or we'd sum forces in the X direction and there'd just be one unknown. Now there were two unknowns in both equations. And so you got to do something a little more fancy, either use substitution, use a elimination. But I think it's a lot easier to just do this, to just do the uh, matrix uh, computation. Uh, any questions before we move on? Yes, I, I think I think this is this is a lot more uh, efficient, and it's it's also much more repetitive because you know you you uh, th th what I like about this approach is that whenever I have a joint that has two diagonal unknowns, I just apply this process every time. Like the thing with substitution and, elim and elimination, I think it requires a tad more intuition and. Honestly, I'm too lazy for that. <laughs> I'd rather just a simple process that works every time uh, because of, I mean, what we're doing is pretty serious. I mean, we're, look, we're talking about members and structures that hold up 127,000 pounds. Anything to make our lives simple and repetitive in that regard is kind of important because I don't want these structures to fall down and kill somebody. So kind of important. Uh, any questions? Okay. All right. Let's um, let's talk about uh, here. Let me let me stop the share. Oh goodness, let me stop the share. And let me um, let me go back to the notes because uh, we actually have a little bit of time, and so I kind of want to explore this other concept, which is a zero force member. Um, I, I put these notes together. I wasn't sure how much time we would have after doing that one example. And I thought, let's let's look at this. Um, I, I'll be honest, I've really never um, uh, uh, emphasized this in classes before, the, the ability to identify zero force member, because I was always of the opinion that if you did the math correctly, the answer would just, it would just be zero. Like, I mean, you did you, the, the, the tricks, if you will, weren't all that big of a deal. But they can make uh, analysis a, a, a bit faster, and they can serve as a gut to ensure that what you did was correct. Um, and also, if you look at some of the problems that we've done before, um, it would be interesting to see if you can apply these tricks to see if, you know, we zero force members in class before, did these tricks still work? Okay. So let's talk about zero force members. So what do I mean by zero force member? I mean a member in a trust that has zero load, no force, no tension, no compression, it's just zero. Um, there are two reasons, first off, why that happens. Um, you know, the first is, uh, like we mentioned before, they may not be there to carry load. They may be there to brace a, a given member. And so that is a very real reason why we would have a zero force member in a truss. But a much more likely reason, especially in bridge engineering land, and I, I tend to refer to things a little bit more in bridges because I'm a bridge engineer, is that they may be zero force members if the loads don't move. In other words, if the loads are here, it's a zero force member. But if the loads move over here, it's not. Okay. And so there are members in, let's say, bridge trusses where depending upon where your load is, it may be a zero force member or it may not because that can change as the truck moves across the bridge. Um, and so you're going to deal with zero force members in a variety of situations when, when dealing with trusses. If you can identify a zero force member without doing any math, it can actually greatly simplify the analysis and it can also serve as a gut check to see what you're doing is correct. For example, if I sh take this truss here that's on the screen, I can tell you that every one of those members are zero force members, the ones that are indicated on the left side of the truss. And I can do that without doing a single equation. No, no math, no computations, no nothing. 
Okay, and you can do that uh, by following three basic rules, looking at the truss on a joint by joint basis. So if you expect the joints one by one, uh, and you follow three basic rules, you can identify these. Now, I, I call them three rules. If you actually open your textbook, I believe your textbook only says it are two rules. I, I've I think depending upon, I think you start get a, getting a little philosophical, you know, as to is it actually two rules or is it actually three rules? Um, I just think this is easier. This is easier to remember and it's easier to follow, okay? So let's just dig into the three rules. The, the first rule is that there's no load applied at the joint, okay? So this works if you have what's true on the screen here. So let's take a look at what we have here on the screen. Let's take a look at this image here on the, um, uh, on the right, this one right here. So if I have a situation like this, this one here that's on the uh, on the right, okay. Now what I have here is I have a joint and it has two members going through the joint, uh, but the forces are inside those members. But there's two uh, members framing into their joint and there's no loads, okay. And why loads? I'm mean, loads. I mean support reactions, but there's nothing being applied at that joint, okay. If this is the case where you have two members framing into a joint and there's no load applied at the joint, these two members are zero force members, okay? And, and honestly, that's not some, you know, magic, you know, just, just you know, a conclusion. This is really just looking at sum of forces in the X direction and sum of forces in the Y direction. See, for instance, let's take this joint. If I have, you know, this, this is a horizontal, so it has one component. This is a horizontal and a diagonal because it's, or a vertical because it's a diagonal. Well, if I sum forces in the X direction, well, this has got to be zero because there's nothing vertical. And if that's zero, that's zero. And so then I sum forces in the Y direction and that's zero, right? So just by looking at it, they're like it, it's zero. There's, not, there's nothing, to, uh, uh, nothing to investigate. Um, that also holds true if you um, have other members that are framed in that have also been determined to be zero. So if you have a joint and there's like four members framing in, but you already figured out that two of them were zero, well, if there's no loads applied, then the others are zero because uh, it's the same rule. There's two member, two unknowns, but there's no loads. That's rule number one. Rule number two, okay, um, if you have two members framing into the joint, but you've got, okay, so let's take this, this image here on the top right. So here's a joint, there's two members framing in. Now there's a load applied, but the load is parallel to one of the members, okay? So like here's the joint, the load is parallel to one of the members. So let's say this is like 20 to the right. Well, if this is 20 kips to right, I'll go ahead and tell you, this one's 20 kips to the left and that one's zero. And the reason it's zero is because if I'm looking at this diagonal, again, this diagonal, it's got a horizontal and a vertical, okay? And because it has a vertical component, if I sum forces in the Y direction, there's nothing going on in the Y direction, that's zero. And because of slope ratios, that's zero. Now, if I sum forces in the X direction, I can't get away with this. So this one has load. That one has load going that way. Oh God, my mouse makes that horrible. Um, that one has load going in the equal uh, and opposite direction, but the diagonal uh, is zero. Now, a very good uh, a practical application of this uh, or is what you see in this image, because if you have like a cantilevered truss and you have a roller on one support, it's possible that you got a reaction from that roller, but you have this vertical member framing in. And if you look at this from the sum of forces in the Y direction, that vertical member is going to contain uh, zero load. And so that's a, that's a, a common uh, reason why, why that would happen. Uh, third rule uh, is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, if you have a member or a joint that has three unknowns uh, and you've got two members that are, two of those joints are, or members are collinear and the third one's off to the side, if there's no loads applied to that joint, again, it's kind of the same idea. You have uh, those two collinear members are gonna be equal and then the one hanging off to the side uh, is going to be zero. Um, I think that the best way to explore this is to look at an example. Okay. So I have here this truss. I'll go ahead and tell you, this truss is weird. Okay. It, it is a it is a wonky, strange truss. 
but it is a perfect trust to illustrate what's going on and how we identify uh, Zero Force members. So I have a trust and I have a 50 kip load applied at this joint E uh, and uh, we have the members arranged as follows. Now all of the diagonal members are at a, a one to one slope ratio. So for instance, if you look at joint H, you know, those members are meeting at 90 degrees. Okay. And so that kind of matters from a geometry perspective. So all the diagonal members are at a one to one slope ratio. And I just want to identify by observation uh, the zero force members. So I'm gonna actually gonna stop my share because I want to do this on the screen. And I want to show you how this works. Okay, so here's the truss. Um, let's see if we can identify some zero force members. And I kind of want to use all of the rules that we've discussed in, in the past few slides. And so we start off with a joint by joint analysis. And I start asking myself, are there any simple joints I can start analyzing? And I go back to my three rules. Okay, what was the first rule? The first rule said that if I had a that had two members and no loads applied, then they were both zero. So how many joints have two members? Well, that's got three, that's got four, three. Now this one has two members, but there's a reaction there. So I'm gonna deal with that one here in a second. What about this one? What about this joint right here? This joint has two members framing in and there's no loads applied. Okay, so just based off of that, I can go ahead and tell you that this member and this member are zero force members. Maybe I'll, I don't know, maybe I'll do something like that. Just so it kind of shows up on the camera a little bit easier. So that and that. Those are zero force members right there. Okay, just by observation. Now, what about rule two? What was rule two? Rule two said that if I had a, uh, uh, a joint and it's got two members, but one of the loads is collinear, then the other is zero. So let's explore that. So first off, I've got a reaction right here going down. Okay. So I know I'm going to, or I've got a force right here going down. So I know I'm going to have, you know, some force here going up. I'm probably going to have some force like that, and then I'm probably going to have some force like that. So we'll call this AX, call this, uh, sorry, GX. That's not AY, it's GX. Okay, can't get away from my reactions. Maybe I'll move this A. Maybe I'll move that like there or something. Okay. So. Let's look at this joint G here. Okay, let's look at that. All right, joint G. I've got two members framing in, two members framing in, and one of the loads, this reaction, is going to be parallel with this member. So if that's the case, you know, this FG member, the magnitude of the force in that's going to be equal to GX, and this. That's a zero force member. It's not going to contain any load. Okay. Now, using that rule, I'm going to ask Chad, are there any other members in the truss that we can identify based off this rule too? That if you have two members or two unknowns framing in, let's ask it this way. Are there any joints remaining in the truss with two unknowns? <sighs> Possibly B, maybe? Well, B, well, maybe. We might have to do a little bit more analysis on that. Joint A, well, joint A, that's true. Although we the two unknowns, we've got this and that, and then there's also two loads there. What about this one right here? What about joint E? Now, joint E has three members, one, two, three, but we know this one's zero. This one's a zero force member. I mean, if I look at joint E, what do I have with joint E? Okay, I've got a 50 kip load right there. I got some like this, and I got some force like that. Like, that's all I have with joint E. I don't have any force going on this way because I know that's zero. So, so if you know that's zero, then you know FE is zero. Exactly. This 
that's a zero force member too. It's a zero force member because if that's a zero force member, if my sum force is in the x direction, there's nothing going on. That's got to be a zero force member as well. Also, just by looking at it, if this is 50 going down, this member experiences 50 kips as well. It's probably it's in tension because it's yanking away from it. That yeah, so yeah, you can simplify a lot of these calculations by just by just looking at the structure. As now, I think BH might be a zero force member because I think uh, you're right. That HF A is just on one line, and the BH is coming off of it, so. That, that, I think that BH has to be a zero force. Exactly. You're exactly right. If you look at rule three, what did rule three state? Okay, if you have a joint with three unknowns, so one, two, three, and two of those unknowns are parallel, so AH and FH are parallel, so this, that's a zero force member as well. Again, no math. No computations, no nothing. So if you go to go to my slide, and I went ahead and gave you the answer for this one. So here's the truss, and then here's the solution. If you look at the solution, all those you know tiny members, the ones with the, the blue dashed lines, those are the zero force members. So we got that one, got that one, got all of them. There are five members in this truss that contain no load, and we did that without any math, okay? Now, I want to be honest, or to be clear, I'm not going to give you a problem on this. I'm not, uh, like, it's, it's a trick. It's a nifty little tool that I think you should uh, uh, have in your toolkit, but again, Let's say even now you're a little fuzzy with it. Well, you would figure all this out by just doing the, the, the problem, right? Just solve the reaction, start doing your method of analysis, start here and move on along the structure, and you'll find that these are all zero force members. There's nothing in this problem that you wouldn't determine through just, you know, rote analysis, okay? Um, but this can make your, your life a little easier when doing the method of joints analysis because, for instance, if I start doing a method of joints analysis at joint A, well, I could start there because, you know, normally there'd be three unknowns, but I know from observation that that vertical is zero, so I could start my problem at joint A if I wanted and then move along the structure, start at joint A, then maybe go to joint B and joint H or something like that. Um, makes my life a little easier as I, as I solve the problem out. Any questions? All right, well, um, what I did for the homework assignment is I gave you um, two problems where I just want you to uh, explore solving the joints with two diagonals. There's two problems where I say, okay, solve this joint, and it's going to have two diagonal unknowns, and I just want you to go through that process. I even gave you the reactions for that homework assignment, so it should be uh, uh, pretty straightforward. If you knew, if you understood how to do the problem that we did in class today, you could probably knock those out uh, pretty quickly. What we're going to do on Wednesday is we're going to look at the method of sections. Again, we're only going to spend like one day on that because, I, I mean, I... I I think it's a valuable skill, but I don't think it should eat up too much real estate for the class because I want to move on from this and cover what I think is an incredibly important topic, maybe even more important, uh, and that's shear and moment diagrams. Uh, so we'll start that on Friday, and then that will eat up our next couple of weeks. Uh, but that's all I have for everybody today. Um, I will see you all on Wednesday. And again, that uh, that homework that was due today at 10, I've extended that to 5. So if you didn't get a chance to get that in, be sure and do that before the end of business. That's all I have, everybody.